Barry, what are we going to need to make this session really good? What are we going to need? You're going to need a couple of horses or a couple of mules. (laughs) That must be the secret recipe to podcasting. A couple horses and a couple mules. Yes! Well, welcome to the show. I'm glad you're here. My name is Chris Curran. I produce podcasts for the likes of Forbes and Dun & Bradstreet and E Plus and others and some business authors. Every week on this show, we bring you podcast production techniques on a silver platter. We actually get down and dirty. We talk shop with podcast producers, engineers, and other experts in the audio field. I have a background in audio engineering in the music business, and since I entered podcasting five years ago, I noticed a huge lack of audio skills in podcasting, and that's where this show can help. If you want to improve your audio of your show or you produce shows for others, this is where you can learn a lot of cool techniques and tricks and tips. And of course, if you implement the best of what you learn here, your podcast will sound a lot better and you'll spend less time producing them. Right? There's always the time factor as well. Right, Barry? Yeah. Oh, yeah. (laughs) That's right. Barry's the maintenance guy in my old building. He's here with me. This show is brought to you by Podcast Engineering School. You've heard me talk about it. We're in the middle of our first batch right now. Actually, we've done six out of seven classes. It's going really well. For anyone who wants to learn how to engineer podcasts at a professional level, the Podcast Engineering School is all about that. I teach students everything they need to know to start a production business or to produce their own show or multiple shows. And it's, it's really in depth at a professional level. This isn't, you know, how to start, how to start a podcast and how to register with iTunes and all that. This is really deep into the audio engineering side of it. So this is what, if this is your first session that you're listening to of this show, uh, we are going to talk about some really cool stuff and I'm, I'll, kind of tease that in a second, but I just want you to know that all our previous episodes where I have guests and we go through their equipment, we go through their workflow and how they do things and how they manipulate the audio. There's a lot of previous episodes. So go back, go back as far as you want and just start. So, and by the way, in previous episodes, I quite often mention the service cast. Uh, I talk about Zencaster and Cast, and I, I, I talked a lot about over the past year about how I decided to use Cast. Well, if you've listened to the last few episodes, Cast has really gone downhill and it's become really not good. So I switched over to Zencaster, which has gone the other way. They've improved so much in the past year. So now I'm using Zencaster. So if you hear me talk about Cast, just ignore that and, and just. Put in the word Zencaster for cast, I guess. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about how I used my Zoom H6 recorder at the recent Pause Your Life retreat. And I used my uh, shotgun mic. I'll tell you all about how I had it set up and, and how I recorded it. And I'm going to talk about something Arik Levy said. He was on the last session, session 54. And I'm going to actually describe the process in which I record the podcast engineering school classes, the live lectures, the inter- the interactive lectures on online, uh, because I actually, uh, you know, I record the classes so that the students can watch the replay, but I definitely treat the audio very specially, obviously. Um, and I use, I'll tell you how I do that and what I use. And then also just a little bit about RX6 advanced. I'll talk about since I just upgraded to that So definitely some content here, and I want to quickly reflect on this show. I don't know, have you? Are you a longtime listener to this show? There's there's quite a few people who've been listening for a long time, and and I just want to reflect. Take a little walk down memory lane, if you will. All right, when did session number one publish? Trivia question. Anyone know? All right, I'll tell you. It was March 10th of 2016. So it was a little over a year ago, a year and two months ago, we, I launched this show. It was right around PodFest of 2016, and we, we just went every week up until uh, Thanksgiving, and I actually took a break last year but from Thanksgiving to the new year, So because I was, again, busy traveling and all that. And then 2017, which is this year, we started first week of January, 
And I don't know if you remember that one. That was session number 38 with Garth Humphreys. And he's he has a show called Audio Pizza. It's And the website is audio.pizza. And I don't know if there's any better branded show or concept on the internet, actually. Audio Pizza, that's brilliant. Anyway, that was January 5th, 2017. And we've been going strong since up till now. And like I said, this will be the last session until August 3rd of 2017. So I've gotten so many emails and so many tweets and, and met so many nice people through this show. I just want to say thank you to everyone. I especially want to give thanks to the new friends I met in Lexington about a month ago at the podcasting course. I told you I was going to give you some shout outs. Anton Hellman and Rob Rogers and Salim and Scott Weingart and Jess Mason and Swami and Will Sanderson and Gita Pensa and Julie Derringer. Uh, great meeting you all. These Most of them were on the faculty. They were teaching. A lot of the, Most of these guys and girls have shows in the emergency medical genre of podcasting, which is blowing up, and th- these folks are leading the way. I was so happy to spend that time with you and, um, and, and just to meet you, and I want to go back and do it again. <laughs> so also, all the previous guests on this show from this year, from 2017, you know, I want to just thank them. Arik Levy, Stefan, Rick Veers, Roy Stegman, Kirk Bowman, Mary's, Mary Mazurik, Made her second appearance this year. Uh, Mike Murphy, Rob Greenley, Patrick Keller, Jason DeFilippo, Adrian Buskey, Zach Haney, and Max Flight also had his second appearance this year. And of course, Garth Humphreys, who I mentioned, uh, audio.pizza. I just, I just like saying it. I like going to the website. <laughs> no, he's actually doing a show called Audio Pizza, and it's about audio. So definitely check out his show. It's, it's uh, he, he, he knows what he's talking about. He's totally into it. And if you heard our episode together, we had a lot of fun. Uh, I want to thank the current students of Podcast Engineering School. And I know we're not done yet. And I know I haven't given you the final exam yet. Uh, well, actually, there is no final exam. But anyway, it, it, the students have been really great. Every, and most of them have been able to really stay on top of everything. And um, others are kind of doing it at their own pace, which is totally fine too. So Ben, Brian, Erica, Hunter, Jim, Josh, Landon, Luke, and Ralph and Carolyn Rivera. And th- those are the students. And, and, uh, I also want to thank Ralph and Carolyn Rivera cause we've been mastermind masterminding for, I don't even know how long now, six or nine months, maybe longer. But it's been really great. We meet every other week and we we mastermind. And it's, I mean, you probably already know the power of masterminding, so I don't have to tell you, but it's just really, really helpful to reflect and to talk about things and talk it out and all that. Also, there's some potential students for the next podcast engineering school, which is going to happen in uh, September of this year. We're going to start. Uh, so Dennis, Chris, Jeff, Jason, Brad, Wendy, and I know there's others. So I'm, I'm happy that you're interested in podcast engineering school. And obviously once I post the dates, you know, the final dates and all the exact information, the final pricing, I'll definitely follow up with you. I've talked with most of you or emailed with you. So also Liza Miller. Thank you. Liza was on the show last year and she's the one who quite often has 15 or 16 people on a podcast at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. So if you did you miss that episode? Uh, oh, I called it an episode. Uh go back and listen to the Liza Miller session. By the way, remember you know how I'm always struggling to remember to call it a session instead of an episode because I just prefer session on this show. I you know I I was going through how I named the the MP3 files and in the name of the MP3 files for each session I was saying episode 001, episode 002, and it's just a habit because that's how I name all my MP3s with all my clients and everything. So isn't it funny? See, you could try to get away from using the word episode, but man, it's not easy. Also, I want to thank Daniel J. Lewis for having me on as an expert uh, helper, an expert consultant, mentor, whatever you want to call it, on his community, Podcasters Society, which is a brilliant community to help podcasters take their show to the next level. Um, well, I shouldn't, well, 
It's okay. <laughs> Someone else uses the phrase next level so much that anytime you use it, it, it almost sounds like you're ripping someone off. <laughs> but anyway, Podcaster Society is like a super helpful community for podcasters and podcast producers. And, and it's, like a, it's like a Facebook group where you can kind of ask questions, but it's like literally a thousand times better. I mean, seriously, the, the level of knowledge in Podcaster Society is unbelievable. And the level of care that you get and you get your questions answered, it's really, it is really phenomenal. Nothing like it exists. And that's why I'm actually happy to be a part of it. And of course, uh, I'm also an affiliate for it. So there's a link in the show notes if you want to check out Podcaster Society. All right, so let's get down to it. Uh, this past weekend, my wife and I flew to the New Jersey, New York area and we had a we facilitated a retreat for our organization which we call pause your life where we do a little bit of meditation and it's all about pressing the pause button on your life and literally just stop the madness and just just literally stop everything and drop all of your roles and titles and just be a human being and it you know th when's the last time you did that yeah i thought so never all right so Pause your life. That's what we do. And anyway, one of the things I do during this retreat is on the very last day, w within a few hours of everyone saying goodbye and leaving, I actually sort of have a chat with each participant one on one and I record it. I record the audio of our chat between me and each participant separately. It's a one on one chat and I record it. And I, what I do is I email them the audio six months later. And I actually asked them to give themselves a message, a message to themselves, their future selves, and six months from now, and I have them record that message to themselves. So it's kind of cool. They get a little message from themselves. Like usually it's an inspirational message or, you know, just encouragement to themselves. Because after a weekend of pausing, you just feel so blissful and so, so great. It's, it's hard to explain. And, 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 and what happens is you go back into normal life and you forget that. Like you just get back into the normal routine of, of being all stressed out and crazy and that you forget that blissful feeling. And so I have them remind themselves of it. Anyway, what I did this time, and uh, I've done it. This is how I've done it other times, but I brought my portable digital recorder. Now I have the Zoom H6. So I brought the Zoom H6 this year. In previous years, I used my older sony m10 which is which is also pretty cool like a handheld portable digital recorder although they don't make the sony m10 anymore they make something like it but it's like a lot more expensive so because it's was that good actually so i set up my zoom h6 and i i brought my shotgun microphone which is an at8035 shotgun mic so Audio Technica 8035, and I set up the mic, the shotgun mic, on a table between us, and I point the shotgun mic right at the participant. And so, I mean, I'm asking questions, but I'm not on mic. I'm like, you know, I'm behind the mic, so the mic doesn't pick me up very much at all. Because I don't want it to. I just want to hear the participants speaking. So I use the shotgun, and I point it right at them, and it was one of my first times using the Zoom H6 and, like, getting levels... So that was, you know, that was good. But the mic ended up being like, I don't know, four feet from the participant's mouth. So, you know, because it's on a table in front of them. So it's it was four, I want to say maybe four, four and a half feet away. So I kind of had to crank up the mic pre because obviously from that distance, it doesn't pick up as much sound. So I had to crank it up, but it worked out well. The sound level was good. Only a couple... There was one participant who was significantly louder than the others, and I actually was thinking about, you know, backing off on the on the mic pre level when it started, but then I didn't. And sure enough, on that person's track, there were like maybe four or five instances where he got a little louder, and it actually distorted slightly. But it's a, it was a slight distortion; it wasn't major and nasty. So, and, and look, for the purpose I'm using it for, it's totally okay. Uh, the Zoom H6 does have a limiter, which you can turn on, which I did have on. So it definitely did a pretty good job of handling the peaking past zero. 
but I don't know how far it went above zero because I wasn't really testing it. I was just kind of using it. But it did distort a little bit. I know on my Sony M10, I can just kill I can just give that thing a lot of level. It can go I'm pretty it can go at least 12 dB past zero before it actually starts to distort. And and that's actually true because I actually tested it. So the Sony M10, the limiter on there is really nice. The Zoom H6, I don't think it was that good, but but it's always good to have a to use a limiter on these portable digital recorders because if anything does go above zero, the limiter will stop it and and limit it so it does not distort and clip. That's the whole point of the limiter. So, um, and and using the my Audio Technica eighty thirty five shotgun mic, I really started thinking and and dreaming and fantasizing about <laughs> the beautiful Sennheiser MKH four sixteen, which is like a renowned voiceover microphone. Which I'm actually sad now. That because I think, I think around Christmas time, it was on sale. Normally, it's about a thousand bucks. It was on sale for six hundred, and I didn't buy it because I didn't have any particular use for it, and I still don't. But it's just the mic is just that good. It's like I just want that mic just to have for liter for for uses like this when I'm at a when I need to just record people with a shotgun microphone. I'd love to use the Sennheiser MKH four sixteen. Instead of my AT8035. Although the mic I use is, is still very good. It's actually a very good mic. It's the one that uh, Alex Bloomberg from Gimlet suggests that you get if you go out and you're going to be interviewing people on site and you're going to actually be holding a microphone and pointing it at someone as you're sort of interviewing them on location or anywhere, really. So it is a good mic, but it's not, not the. Uh, it's not the Sennheiser MKH416 for sure. All right, and I got an email. I just got to tell you about this email I got from Arik Levy, who was on the last session, 54. He's been trying all kinds of microphones, and we talked about it on that session. So if you haven't heard that session, that, that was a good one. Uh, Arik's great because he's trying out stuff. He's really you know listening with a critical ear, and that's like that's the recipe for really dialing in a great sound. Uh, and he, well, I'll, I'm just going to read you what he wrote. Shall I? Okay, I'm just going to read it. Quote, The Rode Broadcaster is the best mic ever. Out of the box, amazing. With no EQ, I sound rich and smooth. NT1 going back. End quote. All right, so he got the Rode, the Rode Broadcaster, which is a large diaphragm condenser microphone, and he was using the Rode NT1, which is, I think it's also a large diaphragm condenser. So I'm, I, I don't know what the difference is, but may, I mean, I'm sure there's this difference, the build and the size and frequency response. But um, anyway, geez, can you tell he's excited about his Rode broadcaster? And look, we've talked about it on the show before. Condenser microphones in general, generally, sound better than dynamic microphones. But... The problem is they pick up so much background noise that for podcasters who are not in a studio environment, someone who's not in a quiet environment, like me, I'm in, a, I'm in my basement. It's a finished basement. I have two big foam panels in the behind me, and I'm using my RE20. It's a vintage RE20 from the 80s. And my heater and air conditioning unit for the, for the house is about 25 feet away it's sort of like halfway around a corner and it's on right now. It's running and I can hear it in the room, but I have the mic pointing the other way and I had the phone behind me. So, and the, and the RE20 is a dyna dynamic microphone. So the mic isn't picking up the, the heating unit, the, H the HVAC unit for the house. But it's when I put, when I put up my condenser microphone, I have a, Aventone CV12, which is a knockoff of the old AKG C12. When I put that here in the same spot with the same foam, same setup, it picks up the HVAC unit. It, it you can hear it. It's like, or more like a motor, like whatever in the background. So condensers are much more 
sensitive and detailed, especially with the high frequencies. The high frequencies just sound much more crisp. But again, if you're not in a very quiet environment, it'll pick up all the background noise. But Arik, I know he uses a gate because he actually doesn't like breaths either. He doesn't like the breath sound, so he actually gates out his own breaths. And, and also the gate cuts out any noise too. So, But of course, when he's talking you can hear the noise in the background, which is not much. He's in a fairly quiet room. He's in a quiet environment for sure. And I think he, I don't know if he had some foam up there, but anyway, it kind of got me like thinking like, oh, well, you know, in the best, in the the best case situation would be if I was using a, a large diaphragm condenser mic, which is true. And so I went looking at the road broadcaster and I found this other guy on YouTube who's, who's, uh, you know, comparing all these different mics for podcasters. And anyway, I went down that rabbit hole for about an hour and a half on YouTube, you know, dreaming of having a nice large diaphragm condenser. But again, in my situation, it's not going to work. And and plus, the mic I'm using is, is very good for a dynamic. It might even be one of the best dynamic mics on the planet for for podcasting and broadcasting, right, for the for, for that. So... Um, so I'm I'm happy with what I have, and someday <laughs> when I'm in a basically a soundproof studio, if ever that happens, I, then maybe I can upgrade to you know a really serious large diaphragm condenser. Which of course my dream microphone is the old tube Neumann U67, which I think they're they cost I think ten grand and up, something like that. Obviously they're from the 50s or 60s i'm not sure but then uh anyway that's that's not (laughs) even i won't do that okay i'm crazy but i'm not that crazy all right the other thing i wanted to explain to you real quick is when i when i'm giving one of the live classes for podcast engineering school i actually record the video and audio of the presentation and then i basically mix it down and i I, I master it into this into a video file which my students can so they can watch the replay of that class and so I want to just explain how I do it because one thing like if you're doing audio only and you have different computers like I'm like right now I'm recording on one computer and I have four other computers here which is how I connect people from online and all this stuff. And and I use Skype to call people on the phone, right? So basically the computer I'm recording on right now, that's all it's doing. It's recording on that computer. It's not doing anything else. It's not connected to anyone online. There's no other programs open. Literally, I just have Reaper open. I'm recording multi-track. That's it. And that's my big production computer. And I prefer that way because then... Because when you open up different programs and you try to do different things, weird stuff happens. So when I'm doing podcasting only, it's fine. But for my for the podcast engineering school classes, I have to do it all on one computer because I need to have a webcam on me. I need to show slides and I need to record the screen so I can save it as a video file and give it to my students to watch the replay. So... So what happened was, well, first of all, I'm using Zoom, which I love, Zoom, uh, and I'm recording locally. Like, you can record with Zoom, you can record into the cloud, or you can record locally. Um, if you record into the cloud, you got to pay for extra cloud space and all that. So um, so I record locally, and I there's a little button you can hit that says, turn on enhanced sound, which apparently makes the sound better but honestly the sound with zoom is just not good overall i'm actually wondering some some people i've heard recently are using zoom to to connect with guests and record podcasts and i'm thinking to myself wow i mean i mean maybe me may, i don't know i don't know maybe it depends on the the person's connection but um anyway the audio even my voice i'm local and i'm having zoom record locally even my voice is significantly degraded in the recording. And I don't know why. And I'm not going to even go into that rabbit hole because none of these, you know, commercial 
products who they're, they're not focused on audio so much, right? If it sounds good enough, it's fine. They're not like you and me who are looking for literally studio quality and, and all that. So, um, so anyway, I'm doing everything on one computer. I'm using Zoom and I'm also recording using Camtasia. I bought Camtasia software because I'm on a, I'm using a PC, uh, running Windows 7 actually. And Camtasia is, screen capturing software which is great i actually really like it it does record my local mic in very you know in just normal the just the highest quality what it is right uh, it doesn't degrade it at all and it can also record system audio so if i open a program like let's say i'm opening soundforge to show my students how to edit something and i play soundforge it'll it'll record that separately from my microphone which is pretty cool so Camtasia records my mic on one track and it records the system audio on another track. I think it records system audio in mono, which is unfortunate because recording in stereo would be more awesomer. But anyway, so I need so now you can see I'm on one computer and 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 I got Zoom running and recording, got Camtasia running and recording, I got PowerPoint open running my slides. I, I have my webcam to show me when I, you know, when it's appropriate. And um, I ha sometimes I have Reaper open. Sometimes I have SoundForge open, Ozone 7, RX6, like my audio program. So I'm just, luckily my computer is an absolute beast that can handle all this. It literally handles all this no problem because it's like one of the most powerful laptops in the world, <laughs> I, I think. I'm, and I'm not even joking. Um, it's four years old now, but back when I bought it, I literally upgraded everything to the utmost and it cost an arm and a leg that laptop but man has it been worth it over time the processing power has just been so worth it anyway so i'm record i'm doing all this on one computer and i have my normally the audio interface that i have connected to that computer is my focus right 18i8 that's how i bring in multi-track into my main recording computer i can record eight I can put in eight XLR mics into this 18i8 and record eight tracks in Reaper or whatever multi-track software I want to use, which I normally use Reaper. So, but when I have the Focusrite 18i8 plugged in, and I'm also trying to do the, all this other stuff with Zoom and Camtasia and everything, it literally doesn't work. Something, every time I open an audio program, this bing noise comes and this pop-up comes and whatever. So... So guess what I had to do? I had to unplug my Focusrite 18i8 audio interface. And what I did, and, and I bought one just to try it, is I bought the, the, the famous Audio-Technica 2100 USB microphone. So I literally plug in the AT2100 to you know, USB into my laptop where I'm running everything else. And I actually plug my headphones into the mic as well because the mic has a little headphone jack on it. And so like that microphone, the AT2100, is my audio interface. And it actually works really well because it doesn't disturb all the other programs on the computer. And plus, I can talk into that mic and it, and it, and it sounds pretty darn good. You all know that's a pretty, pretty good sounding mic. And, and it doesn't you know, cause any problems on that one computer. So anyway, so that's my setup. And so I'll be talking into the AT2100. I'll have my webcam. I'll have Camtasia recording everything. I'll have Zoom recording everything. And then I just go nuts for two hours or two and a half hours doing this lecture, this class. And of course, I'm recording using Zoom and Camtasia. So after it's done, obviously, I hit stop on everything. And Zoom takes a while to process the file and save it locally. That literally takes like a half an hour or more. It takes a while. And so I just save that. I let it run. You know, I go upstairs and either eat dinner or have a snack or something and come down. And so that file is saved. And then Camtasia. What I do with Camtasia is uh, because, like I mentioned, it does record my microphone on one track and the system audio on a separate track. For some reason, it records the system audio very low. And I've asked Camtasia about this. I've tried to find out the answer. There's no, I, there's no answer as far as I can tell. I've looked under every setting 
in Camtasia. There's nothing to do with system audio. Every time I l- try to search for, uh, you know, raise the level of the system audio and the recording, it, it's basically people, you know, telling you how to like raise the the, the mic because because the microphone input does have a slider in Camtasia, so you can you can boost your mic level, and that's what people say. Oh, if you want to boost the level, just push up the fade, push up the microphone fader, and I'm like, no, system audio, not the mic. And then, pe- then other people say, oh, just turn up your headphone volume. That's how you raise the level. And it's like, oh, my God. Anyway, so I couldn't find that. So what I do in Camtasia, you're allowed to export audio only. So what I'll do is I'll mute all the audio tracks except for my microphone. And I'll export my microphone audio so that's on its own track. It's exported as a WAV file. Then, within Camtasia, I'll do the same thing. I'll export the system audio track by itself. I'll mute, I'll mute my microphone and just export the system audio. Then what I do is I open up each of them in my RX-6 Advanced, and I, I, set, I level them. I set them to, I think it's minus 22 LUFs, or do I just set them to minus 19? Actually, either one works because because that's not my final step. So so what what RX six does is it brings up that system audio which is really low. It brings it up to normal level, and it also makes my microphone track at the same level. So then I have two separate tracks which are the same level, nice healthy strong level, and I bring them into Reaper, and that's where I mix them together. And I can actually you know I actually don't do this, but I could EQ one or the other, or I could compress one or the other separately. I don't do that, actually. I just use Reaper to combine the files into one. And by the way, because I'm synchronizing it with video, all the manipulation I'm doing with the audio, I literally have to always keep it the same length and don't don't chop out anything or don't make any ripple deletes or anything. Just so when you're working with audio that goes to video, you can process it, but don't change the length of it don't cut anything off. And also, it's best not even to change the, the bit depth and the sample rate. So for instance, Camtasia puts out audio at 16-bit 44.1 kilohertz. Just leave it in whatever resolution it was in coming out of the video editor. You'll just save yourself potential headaches later. So those are just some good little tips there. So after I mix my mic and the system audio together in Reaper... Then I actually bring it up in Ozone 7 and I master it. I apply compression to the whole thing. And not much, but I just apply some compression and limiting just to tighten it up. Uh, And then I take it out of Ozone. And by the way, something weird that Ozone does, and I've I've asked them about this too. And so quite often I'll want to bring something into Ozone that's a mono file. Okay, now look, Ozone is generally made for music, which is literally basically always stereo, right? I mean, who 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 puts out music in mono these days? I mean, real, if you find one, just tweet at me or something. So Ozone is always used to mastering music in stereo. So when I bring up a mono file in there, I can bring up a mono file, but when I mix it down, it spits out left and right. It spits out a stereo file, even though the left and right are identical. So technically it is mono. There's there's nothing happening in the stereo spectrum on the left or the right that you know is different. It's literally exactly the same, but it spits out left and right. And I don't need left and right. It's just doubling my file size for no reason. So after I come out of Ozone, I always just quickly bring it up in SoundForge and say and as a stereo file, it comes up as a stereo file and I save it as a mono file. So literally, I just open it and resave it as a mono file. And it's the same file name, same resolution, same everything, but just mono. And then, I, that, and then the final step is to bring that mastered mono file into RX-6 again. And that's where I do the final leveling. So if it's, mo- if it's mono, which it is, I set the final LUFs to minus 19, which is the standard for podcasting. For videos, I don't know what the standard is, but... Minus 19 is a good standard, so I, that's what I just use for mono. Minus 16 for stereo. So, and then 
Then I have my final audio file. It's been, everything's been leveled. It's been combined. It's been mastered. And then final, the LUFS level for the loudness level is all set. Then I literally bring that final audio file into Camtasia. And I'll bring it, I'll just line it up with the video. And I'll just mute the other two tracks, my, the original two tracks. And then I'll have to render the video. And so what it's what it does then is it renders the video with with my final audio track as part of it. So then that takes a while too. I mean, if it's a two and a half hour class, it might take might take a half an hour to render the video, or maybe twenty minutes. I don't know. Sometimes I walk away and then I come back. I don't know how long it took, <laughs> but it takes a while. It really does take a while. And even with the strong and fast machine, still takes a while. So that, uh, that's how I, I just wanted to, I thought that was an interesting process of how I'm producing and finalizing these recordings of the classes. Uh, because for me, again, I'm just used to doing audio only. I'm not into the screen capture and all this and the resolution. And for me, that's kind of like all new and it's not my expertise. So, and, and, and the, the problem I was having with my Focusrite audio interface messing everything up, that took me a while to figure out because I wanted to use it. I didn't want to use an AT2100, ATR2100. I've been saying AT2100, right? That's ATR2100, USB. There you go. That's the full correct name of that microphone. Anyway, so then I upload... uh, I'm actually sharing the video with my students through Vimeo because I can make it like password protected. So all the playbacks of all the classes are... I give the students the link and the password and they can watch it, but you know, no one can download it. No one can share it and all that because, uh, you know, it's valuable stuff. (laughs) All right. So that was that. uh, Next thing is RX six advanced. I was using RX five advanced for about, I'd say six months. And then RX six advanced came out, which is even way better. And by the way, these RX six is, basically an audio restoration tool that does like a million things it's just like if there's if there's anything wrong with audio if you have bad audio in any way whether it's clicks or hums or noise or pops or or phase or anything rx6 advanced can fix anything basically now it's not magic as i always say it's not magic if if you have a crazy amount of noise on someone's track you you can take out some of it. You can never take out all of it or else you'll just destroy the actual sound of the person's voice as well. Right? So so nothing none of these audio processors are magic, but they do help and especially if you use them properly, they do really help a lot. So I upgraded from 5 and by the way, one thing about RX6 Advanced, which is again the ultimate tool for fixing bad audio. If anyone is like producing podcasts for other people, or mixing podcasts or anything. And and even for video, you know, audio for video, a lot of people use RX6 Advanced. It's just so helpful. It's like it just takes care of so it just it's just a tool that does so much and takes the headache out of so many things. It's hard to even comprehend until you buy it and own it and then you're like, "Oh my god, this is awesome." And then people like people ask me questions all the time. "How do you get rid of reverb on someone's track?" And I mean, my personal answer is RX6 Advanced, but I realize it's a $1,200 software and not everyone's going to be able to have that. So then I have to tell them, you know, go, you just look for, maybe look for a a single standalone plugin and all this. So did you know that students of the Podcast Engineering School get 50% off of RX6 Advanced? So instead of $1,200, it's only $599 which is a steal. I hope some of my current students take advantage of that. Um, I think Ralph and Carolyn Rivera said they were going to do that, but it's worth it. it it's, it's really worth it. If you're producing a bunch of audio and the audio you're getting sometimes is heinous. <laughs> it just happens. You know, this whole, you know, the new, well, it's not new anymore, but for the past two, three years, like so many podcast guests are joining the podcast using earbuds which sometimes is not bad. Sometimes it's actually very good, but sometimes it's horrible. Sometimes there's like a, 
the earbuds themselves have like a built in noise. It's like white noise. It's like shh. And you can't, you, you, there's, there's nothing you can do to change it. So, anyway, those are some of the, well, we talk a lot in the podcast engineering school course about how to handle all kinds of problems. I mean, that's, that's me giving you all my tricks and techniques and all that. Anyway, so RX6 Advanced, I mainly use it for uh, the voice denoise. So again, if there's just noise on the track, you can uh, use that. Phase, sometimes if the wave is like skewed toward the positive or negative, you know, sometimes the wave, the waveform itself looks lopsided. And generally, that's not an issue at all. We've talked about this in Podcaster Society, uh, the community. Uh, it's it's not a it doesn't hurt anything, but it actually reduces your headroom because the wave goes higher on one side. So sometimes if you're processing audio, and the wave is is uh, is is a little bit, it, the phase is a little off, it'll it'll clip sooner, but you'll have less headroom. And again, usually it's not a problem. But anyway, that phasing, that lopsided wave, the, the wave that looks lopsided, you RX six can just make it completely balanced and even uh, the loudness obviously i use in rx6 advanced and ralph just asked me about this on the podcast engineering school class number six out of seven he said when do you do the loudness when do you set the loudness of a podcast episode and the answer is at the very end that's the last step you do some people in for instance in their multi-track daw a lot of people use audition and audition you can actually set the luffs level of an individual clip in audition. So some people they'll go through, let's say they have three tracks in, in Adobe audition. They'll just set, set the luffs of each clip to minus 19 and then mix it down. The problem is when you mix it down, the overall file is probably not going to be exactly minus 19, especially if people talk at the same time. Sometimes it's going to be louder. Maybe it's going to be minus 18 and a half or even minus 18. Then you have the whole problem of the music, the level of music you got to use your ear with music. I mean, you can't use Luff's level to mix music with a voice. I mean, you can use that as a starting point, maybe, but you got to use your ears. So the correct answer is, you know, level it to the Luff's loudness standard at the, that's the very, very last step. And so that's what I use RX6 Advanced for. A lot, a lot of people use Auphonic. You can just upload it to Auphonic and tell it to spit out an MP3 at minus 19 Luff's and... Boom, there it is. Uh, a lot of people do that. That's a that's a good way to do it, actually, if you don't want to spend the money or do it through RX6. You can do some EQing in RX6. Sometimes I do this with the low end. Like sometimes you can see on the spectral display that like in the I'm talking real low end, like 40 and 50 hertz and below. There's just a lot of that. And you don't need that on a voice. So you can roll it off. You can you can bring that down in right in RX6 Advanced. There's also a D-click. So sometimes if there's clicking, there's also a D-mouth click, like a mouth click thing. <laughs> I haven't tried that yet. And there's a D-hum as well. Sometimes on the spectral display, you can see like a horizontal line. It's literally a hum. It's like, hmm. And you can have RX6 Advanced like search. Like you hit, uh, is it suggest? I think you suggest, and then it it'll actually find the hums, the exact frequency, and then you just hit remove, and it goes, and then you could see the line disappears. <laughs> I mean, and you just get rid of you just got rid of a hum. Anyway, so anyway, that's a great tool. I upgraded for that reason, and you know, for what I do, it's a great it's a great tool to have. So that's gonna be it for this session. If you've stuck with me this long, thank you. I really enjoy doing the show. I really enjoy helping people understand the audio engineering aspects of podcast production. And I'm and I, that, the reason I gave all the shout outs too in the beginning of this session is because I really am so thankful for everyone who has helped me with this show and, and contributed and helped and, and folks who will contribute. It, I mean, look, in life, we can never do anything totally by ourselves, right? We always have a team of people around us. We always have contributors. And so I'm really grateful to everyone who's helped me and contributed to this show. And I think it's been helpful. I've gotten, I mean, so much positive feedback. I mean, I've never, I've never, well, no, that's not true. Cause I do the mystic show as well. Although I haven't done an episode in a long time, like 
two and a half, three months because I have actually haven't had anything to say and I've been on more of a reading and learning phase rather than a talking phase. Uh, but anyway, on the Mystic Show, some people have written and said, wow, this is a great show. Thank you so much. But the Podcast Engineering Show by far is the show where people just email me and they're like, wow, I love your show. Thank you so much. I mean, Barry, you like this show? Oh, forget it. <laughs> I'm telling you. Jeez. <laughs> and I, But yeah, hey, there's another Barry clip that I don't use very much. I used to use it when I did a show with Mike Michalowicz. You know, because of his last name, Michalowicz, I would sometimes get to use uh, this clip from Barry. That's a tongue twister right there. <laughs> That's a tongue twister right there. That's a tongue twister right there. <laughs> That's right. So as I said before, definitely check out all the previous episodes. And, you know, there's been a lot of them. So if you haven't listened to them all, you can always go back. You can start at session number one if you want. But thanks for listening. I hope you're getting a lot from this. Send me a note. Send me a love note like Ralph Rivera does. And until you know what to do, come on. Say it right now before I do. Go. All right. All right. Thanks, everybody. Sound great. Yeah.